What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Jeremy Jensen of Encore Search, and you can check them out. Before I formally introduce you, Jeremy, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out of the podcast. Jeremy's a big, and we're going to talk about this actually, uh, EOS, big on EOS. Um, Everyone can check out the interview I did with Gino Wickman also with Mark Winters of Rocket Fuel. He um, co-authored the book Rocket Fuel with Gino Wickman where it talks about the visionary and the integrator. So check both those episodes out. Um, also, big shout out to Travis, the founder of Glide Design. This interview wouldn't be happening without Travis. And they're a values-driven digital creative agency in Austin, Texas. So check them out. Um, also, we're gonna. you have a great story about a police chief, Jeremy, which we'll get into. Um, Jason Smith is an agency owner, um, Spotlight Social Advertising, and he was fighting gangs. He was with the LAPD before becoming an agency owner. It's not someone I would want to mess with for sure. Um, but check all those episodes out and more on inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. And at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 partnerships and relationships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do accountability strategy, but the full execution Jeremy, we kind of call ourselves the magic elves that are in the background to make sure to make it look easy for the host and the company to get everything out there. You know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com. We have lots of free resources answering almost every question that we've gotten on the podcast too. So without further ado, Jeremy Jensen, he's founder and CEO of Encore Search Partners. It's a 40 person direct hire and executive search firm located in the great city of Houston. Um, It's focused on headhunting professional and technical talent nationwide. Um, He's a subject matter expert on EOS, like I mentioned, which is the entrepreneurial operating system. He's a fellow member of EO, Entrepreneurs Organization. We'll probably see each other in a little little bit in Detroit. Um, and EO is a 16, over 16,000 member global organization of some of the top entrepreneurs all around the world. And Jeremy's also an active investor, innovator, and builder of others in his local Houston community. Jeremy, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great introduction. It's well-deserved. And I want to hear from your words. Tell people more about Encore Search and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. So as you mentioned, we're a 40 person direct hire recruiting firm. So companies turn to us as a grudge purchase whenever they're having trouble finding high level professional and technical talent. Yeah. You know, writing, you know, it's so funny. I'm one of the few industries where it's like the bigger the fee, the easier it is for the client to write the check. And I'll give you an example. If you're recruiting an 80K outside salesperson, you're writing me a $25,000 check, 20, 25 grand, that might be a tough pill to swallow. The person hasn't sold anything yet. But what if it's an attorney that's got a $3 million book of business and you're writing me a $250,000 fee? That becomes a lot easier of a check to write, right? They're going to bring that book of business and the profit that comes along with it. So we like to focus on the high level positions for sure. I want to talk about attracting talent. And this is what you do. This is what you do for other people. It's actually what you do for yourself. Um, you have some great LinkedIn posts. I want to encourage people to check them out. Um, I was reading uh, them and um, one of them was 15 million, right? Yeah. Um, talk about that for a second. Yeah, definitely. So about seven years ago, I brought on board uh, an individual contributor. His name is Casey Knight. And it was right after oil and gas had crashed here in Houston, Texas. And so I saw my business go from about a million dollars in revenue down to almost zero. Uh, So I was flirting with Casey. I actually went to high school with him. We weren't really friends, but we were connected on social media. 
And he was thinking about making a change. And uh, whenever I visited with him for coffee at Black Walnut Cafe in Katy, Texas, uh, he was voicing some frustrations about his current firm. He was a recruiter for financial advisors. And uh, I'd never even, you know, thought about recruiting for financial advisors. These are stockbrokers at UBS, Merrill Lynch, Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, Morgan Stanley, et cetera. And when he told me about the fee structure on how he generated fees on moving that individual, it really piqued my interest. And so in May of 2016, Casey came on board as an individual contributor. And today, he's now executive VP in the firm with our largest book of business in his specific vertical. They do about seven and a half million in revenue. So if he was a partner at a law firm, his practice area would be about a $7.5 million book. And uh, and then that was a celebration. That post was maybe a couple of years ago, whenever he hit 15 million. And I just thought that that was like such, you know, a massive milestone for somebody that came in at the ground floor, they believed in in my technical competency. They believed in the vision that I painted for the future of the company and our real estate and our dress code and our amenities. And, you know, he started with one placement. I think it went down in September of 2016. And he hit that milestone in late 2020, early 21 of 15 million in revenue. So very, very proud to celebrate that. Now, Casey's probably at 25 million. Talk about, you know, I want to, I'm going to show something in a second um, because I love this, this post, but I want you to talk about was it how that was as a tough hire. You know, you mentioned, you know, the energy and I appreciate you sharing, you know, the energy, you know, oil and gas business went to not a lot at that time. Yeah. And it's not now looking back, it seems obvious, but at that point, in your business, it seems like it's not necessarily an easy decision to hire anyone for that matter. And I just want to point out, like, here's, it made me, um, Jeremy, when I looked at this post, I thought I was going to be watching a Netflix special. Like, <laughs> I, I, I love the image here. Yep. I want to go watch the Netflix special Billers. Okay. So uh, you guys have another business of just like, putting Netflix special images out there. I love this. But um well this is definitely inspired by the famed HBO series Ballers with the Rock. And so what we did was we just put Casey's face on the Rock's body and changed <laughs> exactly. the A to an I. Uh so that's the actual uh I guess album cover to the TV show Ballers. Yeah, I'm going to go watch Billers. I was looking for Netflix. I couldn't find it. You know, people oh. often say that I need my own YouTube show or or Netflix special. And, you know, I think it could be uh, in the cards in the future one day for sure. Yeah. Talk about that being um, maybe not so obvious or tough hire at the time. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, I think the reason why it may have been a tough hire is because at the time, you know, Casey had a stay at home wife. Uh, he had two young children. I, I believe they were expecting their third at the time. And I had to twist his arm and convince him to leave, leave a firm that he had just made about $180,000, uh, uh, you know, at the last year, right? That, that year before he came on board. And so, you know, we all know that in a, in a, in a recruiting model or, or any time that you generate revenue as an individual contributor and producer, your your compensation is tied to what you produce, right? And that was the very first time that I was faced with needing to pay someone a six-figure base salary just to get them on board, you know? And, you know, we're flashing all the way back to 2016. You know, we just started in 2013. Um, and so, you know, when everybody else was at that 50 to 65, K mark bringing in Casey at a 120 base was a massive pill to swallow. But you know what's funny about hiring him and seeing what he was able to create with his own intellectual capital and network and ideas and creativity was I saw the difference between a 120 person and a 60 person. And then five months later, that gave me the confidence to go offer another, you know, 150 salary to get somebody at the VP level. And that gentleman is named Scott Kelly. And, and I'm proud to say that, that, you know, in, in the last six and a half years, Scott's been promoted three times, VP, senior VP, 
executive VP, and now he's the president of the company. And so I'm so grateful that I that, that I took the leap of faith and went and and and, and kind of paid more than, than I'd ever paid anybody else. Uh, because it shouldn't all be on my shoulders. And I'm talking about the business development efforts, the creativity, the innovation. And 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 now we've got a four-headed uh, monster as well because we've added another VP since then, who is Christina Lyles, uh, our VP of Legal Search. I mean, it is a, a at that time I think of it as a huge leap, right? Six-figure salary. Um, I'd love to talk about the COO delegation and that process from deciding to do it to doing it. Because that seems like it was also a big decision as well. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, in 2015, I was in a group called Vistage. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but, you know, Vistage is a peer-to-peer -peer executive advisory group for mid-level managers and C-level executives. And, you know, I was in there with a young man kind of venting about my business, man. You know, the recruiters are lazy. Their Their work ethic is poor. They're taking shortcuts. And, and he's like, damn, Jeremy, you must be losing a lot of money. I said, what are you talking about? I made half a million dollars last year. And so in, in having these conversations with Scott in an environment where he didn't really have insight into a professional service firm where they had those big individual tickets that yielded this massive amount of net income. Um, he basically told me, he said, damn, Jeremy, what if you actually implement, implemented processes, systems, and accountability? And I said, oh, yeah, that sounds all fun and good, but I'm only good at sales. <laughs> and he said, well, well, I can do it for you. And I said, well, well, Scott, uh, you know, I, I don't think I can afford you. And so... You know, it took a little bit of creativity in order to get him. You know, he needed that six-figure base because he had a young family at the time in a single-income household. And uh and he and we negotiated a percentage of top-line revenue as a as a VP non-producer operations guy. But I knew that we were in an industry where sales would solve the bottom line, right? And I needed somebody that could help hold me accountable to achieving our business milestone goals and implementing those processes, systems, and ultimately accountability for the team. And so bringing Scott in in October of 2016, you know, it was tough. It was tough for my internal people. They all had agency recruiting experience. Scott came from, a, from an IT consulting company. He didn't have any recruiting industry experience, but what he knew was how to implement EOS, the entrepreneurial operating system, because he'd been doing it the previous five years at his current firm, going from 24 years old to 29 years old. And it was his personal goal as a kid to be a vice president by the time he was 30. And he'll tell everyone to this day, he beat it by one month. Uh, and so we hired him as VP. That was one of the big stipulations. But his title at the time was sales and operations manager. You never would have thought that this guy would grow up into being the president of the largest privately held executive search firm in Houston, Texas. But he he eat, sleeped, and, and, and drank Gino Wickman's Kool-Aid, I'll tell you that, EOS. And so Scott brought that toolbox with him uh, in 2016. We didn't really touch the toolbox until December of 2017 because it took him a full year to learn our culture to learn, you know, the way that we charge fees, who are our target clients, what were our unique selling points, what would be our rocks. And then he didn't want to influence too much change overnight because we were kind of building, rebuilding after an oil and gas downturn, right? And so in December of 17, Scott implemented EOS. And that's what really forced our business to skyrocket. I mean, we went from 1 million to 2.6 million, to 4.2, to 5.5. COVID was kind of a flat year because we lost revenue for a full quarter. But then last year, you know, we did nearly $12 million in revenue. And the goal this year is upwards of 14. And so in a professional service environment, like a public accounting firm or a private equity firm or an investment banking firm, a $14 million business can yield some pretty profitable margins for sure. 
Yeah, and I tie like, it to EOS. Yeah. It sounded like he came in and really did a lot of learning and listening and understanding. And then he was ready to hit the ground running. And he's kind of, I mean, you're the visionary type and he's the integrator type. And that's why they call it rocket fuel, right? With uh, Mark Winters and Gino Wickman. Absolutely. And, you know, it's it's funny because I think he had envisioned the whole timeline the entire time, but he never told me. Right. And I don't think that I would have had the guts to go out and buy a 250K COO because my business really couldn't support it. So I got the guy that was 120, 150 on day one, and he grew in to the guy that I'm proud to say is my back to back in the company for sure. Talk about implementing EOS. I mean, obviously you had an expert who had done it, but you know, the team still has to implement and execute. Talk about how the implementation worked. Sure. So most of the time companies hire an EOS implementer, somebody you pay anywhere from $6,000 to $10,000 a day to help you formally implement it into your C-suite and and mid-level management team, right? Um, You know, that really wasn't something that I was willing to invest in at the time. And so we self-implemented. Again, like I said, Scott was familiar with it because his company had been doing it for the previous four or five years. But um, I think one thing that was very, very important for Scott to have is we still kept him with his Visage coach, Christine Spray, who is also a certified master EOS implementer, right? And so he always had that resource whenever he needed needed it because his business coach was an EOS certified professional. And so when Scott rolled it out and it rolled it out in December of 2017, I remember we were sitting at our, uh, at my dining room table uh, in my house and we had planned to be there, I think for seven hours, it was me, Scott and Casey, myself and my two VPs. And we ended up staying there for 10 hours. And, 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 And during that, we had to define several things. What was our mission? What, were, what was our vision? What were our values, our unique selling point? What's our why, right? Um, what are our rocks? What are those strategic initiatives that we need to tackle over the next quarter, over the next year? What about over the next five and 10 years? We needed to provide clarity in that meeting. That way, the right hand could continue to talk to the left hand going forward. And it's so funny, as a headhunter, I see $100 million companies. $500 million companies, completely misaligned mission, vision, and values. Everyone's got their own individual P&L, and they're operating with a different culture, a different strategy, right? You've got sales shitting on operations, operations blaming sales, right? And there's no continuity. There's nobody working together. And that ultimately kills the culture and then the bottom line. What were some key pieces to the um, EOS format that you like? Because I know there's a lot of different pieces, like you mentioned the rocks and there's level 10 meetings. What are some of the key pieces that you go back to and go, wow, I can't believe we lived without this beforehand? Yeah, definitely. So it would certainly be those executive offsite strategy sessions that we do once a quarter. Um, my president, Scott Kelly, who, who was hired as VP, then later promoted, then promoted again. He's the one that prepares the agenda for that, where we identify, discuss, and solve issues in the company. We have our people analyzer. We determine are people in the right seats on the bus? Who are the culture killers? We need to get them off the bus, even if they're a high revenue producer, they may be stunting the growth of of those around them, right? And so, you know, really I'll say that it was a combination of all the tools and resources, but the one thing that we needed was that integrator the individual that could hold myself accountable and my VP accountable, who is the individual that manages that $7 million book of business, because we're the rainmakers, dude. We are ADD. We don't need to prepare for meetings. We just walk in, you give us the microphone, we execute, right? Scott was the planner. He's the guy that could foresee the challenges and bottlenecks before they even happen, right? Casey and I are the ones that wait till they happen, and then we just bust the wall down, right? But that's not sustainable whenever you're building a profitable business. And so it was the integrator that was key. I'm sure there's been some heated discussions um, throughout the course of the company. When you put those two, and they're almost, I don't know, opposing 
things, but like, what are some conversations, Jeremy, you're smiling at me. Yeah. yeah. You butt heads about because you come in, you're like, don't worry about it. I mean, I get, like, we got this. I don't think we need to plan. Let's just go, go, <laughs> go. I mean, this yeah. is the visionary and the integrator, right? The push pull there. What are some things that you maybe butt heads on, but like come out the other side and it's better? Absolutely. So I'm going to have to go back really far in the memory bank right now, because I'll say for the first two years, we butt, butted heads on a lot. And then a couple things happened. You know, my president went through a divorce. I went through a divorce. Those were both very humbling experiences where you're forced to look in the mirror and say, you, you can make one of two decisions. You could point the finger at the other person and say, them, 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 or you do what Scott and I did. You look in the mirror and you say, how did I fail? Where did I go wrong? And so, you know, it was taking on that level of humility, being self-aware, being coachable. Uh, I think that was very, very important for Scott and myself to really learn how to see the other side of the table, right? And, and, and pursue conversations with empathy and seek to understand by putting myself in the other person's shoes, right? And so I wouldn't necessarily say that that we've had too many disagreements, um, you know, since late 2019, because those quarterly strategy sessions really keep the pulse, right? Maybe if, if let's say there's a spectrum and it's, and it's zero to 100 this way and zero to 100 this way in a quarter, you could probably get to about 15 to 20. And then that that strategy session brings you back, recalibrates, right? But if you could go a whole year, or sometimes companies don't even do it at all, you could be 80% in opposite directions. That's whenever it creates the blowups and the irreparable damage, right? Um, and so I'll say that uh that it's those quarterly strategy sessions that really reduce it. But you know, maybe a disagreement. You know, I remember when. When, when you know, Casey came on as VP in May of 2016, Scott came on as VP in October of 2016. Well, guess what? In January of 2020, Scott was promoted to president. Scott came after Casey. What the hell? What, what? Right? I sit down with Casey. I said, Casey, do, do you want to be the president of the company? Do you want to be the backstop? Do you want to be the integrator? Do you want to be operational process systems accountability? Right. Well, no, I just want to sell. <laughs> like if you put it like that, Jeremy. Yeah. No, I just want to generate revenue. I want to make a bunch of money. That's what drives Casey Knight. Right. And so it, it did require myself, Scott, and him sitting down to where we needed to illustrate, hey, Casey, just because Scott is the president doesn't diminish your role in any capacity. If we were a train, right? I, I, Casey's used this analogy before. Let's say Encore Search Partners is the train. Well, Scott might be the engineer, right? Jeremy provides the tracks, and then it's Casey that's pouring the fuel into the train. Does that make sense? So it, it cannot operate without all, all three. And so when you realize, hey, I need to own my role and, and my colleagues, right, my associates at the VPNC level, there, there's a tremendous amount of mutual respect and admiration that we have for another, but, but not because of our technical competency, but because we know that it couldn't operate without the other person. That was very, very important to remove that ego to keep us on the right track. Yeah. Culture. I want to know about maintaining culture. And you mentioned culture killers. What are some culture killers in your organization? You know, I think culture killers uh, could be individuals that gossip. Um, I think that that's a massive culture killer. I think that, you know, most employees want to go to work and, and <laughs> they want to do their job. They want to be paid fairly. They want to be treated with respect and they want to go home. Right. <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, individuals that feed into spreading gossip or rumors or uh, trying to, uh, you know, uh, create chaos in the organization are massive culture killers, even if they're high performers from a revenue generation standpoint. Right. So that's number one. 
another one could be, you know, I'm thinking about ones that we've had in the past, um, you know, in, individuals that think that they're better than their colleagues, right? Um, and, and when I say better, uh, what I mean is is more like uh, entitlement or, um, you know, they, they're not held to the same standard of excellence to the core values of what everyone else is. So they talk down to people, they diminish other people's roles. I think that can be a massive culture killer, right? And so, you know, on previous podcasts, I've talked about, you know, one individual at the time that was generating revenue figures that we had really never seen before. You know, a 900K producer in one year in 2019. And there was a young associate in the firm that he was kind of rubbing the wrong way. And she voiced some frustrations, didn't want to entirely throw him under the bus. But frankly, it wasn't something that I was okay with. And ultimately, we had to manage that that one individual out of the organization. But it's so funny, Jeremy. That young associate that he was rubbing the wrong way, the next year she billed 1.2 million. The year after that, she billed 1.5 million. Remember how I told you we'd never seen 900K before? Well, by removing that emotional and physical roadblock, she was able to completely outperform what he was doing. And that's the young lady that grew into our vice president of legal. And so by keeping someone who we all thought was a massively high performer, we would have lost someone that I view as my equal in the company, right? Um, I mean, that's that would have been a very, very expensive decision to make, I'll tell you that. Jeremy, I want to talk about the um, the gossip. You know, like, like you said, it, these are tough. At the time, sometimes they seem tough. I mean, maybe torn is a better better statement. Like these are high producers, you know, they do well in the company. So if there's a piece there, sometimes it's, it's tough to make the decision. Um, how do you approach someone, you know, they're good person, um, but they are exhibiting one of those behaviors like gossiping. Mm -hmm. How do you approach it with, with yeah, gossip, gossip, toxicity, yeah. yeah, chaos. Yeah. I'm sure. Cause someone listening, you know, I probably, think it's, experiencing i mean in some level yep. this so i'm i'd love to hear how you handle it yeah i think it's very important to tie uh the coaching conversation to one of your core values and you know if if you can't tie the coaching conversation to a core value then you should probably add a value to the wall right and so when you look at you know our our why right it's to be the best, it's to close deals, and to make money, right? That's our why. Sounds very, very simple, but that's why we all come to work each and every day. Um, and so there may be, you know, an opportunity to coach and say, hey, look, what you're doing is not contributing to our why. It's actually pulling away from it. It's distracting from it. Let's have a conversation. What's driving that gossip? Let me see if I can solve that problem as an executive leader, Right. But number two, you know, when you look at our core values of excellence, meticulous, coachable, professionalism, gratitude, um, and and competitive, right? Um, you know, I think it's very important to tie specific core values to that the, to that coaching opportunity as well, right? And core values shouldn't just be something that's on the website or on the wall. You know, we talk about our core values. In every single level 10 meeting, every single Monday at 2 p.m., we talk about our values uh, every single one-on-one -on -one coaching session. Um, we talk about our core values um, in the interview process. They're outlined in the offer letter. You are committing to these values just like they're KPIs, right, to hit as a sales professional, right? And so, you know, another thing that I'm very proud of is the values and always hitting those home while most companies give out end of year awards to the president's club and the circle of excellence and the and the gold members and platinum members of revenue figures. We give out bonuses and we give out accolades and awards for our core value champions. And so creating creating a culture around having that shared mission, vision and values is imperative to long-term growth and success, which ultimately drives profitability. 
What is a frequency and how do you run the the one-on-one coaching session? Sure. So for new employees, uh, our COO and president, he meets with them um, about once a week for the first 90 days, just to make sure that, um, you know, (laughs) number one, they've got the right tools and resources to be successful. You'd be surprised at how many people start jobs and they don't even bring it up until the second month. We're like, oh, I don't, I don't even have that login. Right. Um, So it's important to keep a very, very close pulse on them for at least the first few weeks. Right. Um, and then after that, some of the cadence that goes to once every two weeks for individuals that we call run a full desk, right? So that means they handle client relationships and candidate relationships. Uh, and then for individuals that are non-producers or individuals that just handle the candidate recruiting side, they can potentially go to every three weeks, right? Um, and so that's kind of the cadence of what we do with our one-on-ones. But with that being said, a little bit over a year ago, I posted into the EO group WhatsApp needs and leads. And I said, man, you know, I've been watching this show billions and uh, I think I need a Wendy. I want a Wendy for the company. Right. Are you familiar with the show? So uh, she's basically like the company therapist, but she's so valuable to the executive team that Bobby Axelrod, Axelrod, the owner of the firm, gives her a $25 million bonus at the end of the year. That's the value that she creates to maintaining the mindset and maximizing performance of their most valuable asset, which is their people, right? They're a hedge fund in New York that manages over 15 billion AUM. Um, but, uh, but I needed a Wendy. And so We ended up hiring in April of 2022, an individual named Matab Maradi, who is a licensed clinician at performance and mindset coach um, to kind of come in every Tuesday and Thursday and have those 45 minute sessions with our employees that they can book just like we were in a therapist office. Right. But it's their performance and mindset coach. And so, you know, after learning our culture seeing some common issues that people were facing, whether it be, you know, imposter syndrome or, or, you know, having um, uh, a lack of empathy for their colleagues. She ended up developing curriculum around having small group breakout sessions to do like eight to 10 person focus groups where they can all increase their emotional intelligence, their self-awareness, their executive presence. So it's kind of like a hodgepodge of like having a therapist and Toastmasters and a business coach. And, a, you know, it's it's pretty awesome, man. I love it. Thanks for sharing yeah. that. That's huge. Um, I want to talk about the police chief. And what happened the with police the police chief? chief. <laughs> it's my good friend, John Nichols. <laughs> you know, I talk about Jason Smith going from yeah. LAPD fighting gangs, literally fighting gangs to agency owners. So I, I want to hear the police chief story. Yeah. So, so the funny thing about the police chief is people hit me up every day. Hey, Jeremy, I'm looking for a job. And because of the nature of what we do, I mean, we're like, you know, purple squirrel hunters. Companies tell us they need a left-handed female certified financial planner in Northern California that went to a public college that grew up with the single parent. Okay, we got it. You know what I'm saying? Like the most rare of rare things. That's what we specialize. And so people that are typically looking for a job, maybe they they don't fit one of our clients exact parameters. Right. But I'd had my ex-wife, her her college roommate's husband gave me a ring. He was the the chief of police for Southwestern Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. And he said, Jeremy, I'm, I need to make a change, right? You know, and it, we had some changes in leadership. I don't like the way the direction of the seminary is going. I want to go into corporate America. I said, John, we don't like, you know, companies pay me big fees because they need someone doing the exact same job at the company across the street and they want to steal that intellectual capital. Okay. Literally that afternoon, I get a call from one of my clients, the senior vice president of human resources for a 1,500-person private equity-owned oil and gas service company. 
and he says, Jeremy, I need a field HR manager in Lubbock, Texas. Okay, well, what do we, what do we want? He goes, I don't want anyone with HR experience. He said, they have a mindset where they want to protect the employees, but what, this is all field services, man, right? These guys are a little rough around the edges. They get their hands dirty sometimes, you know? And he said, I want someone that is skilled with investigations, that has strong attention to detail on filling out reports, right? Somebody that knows how to handle themselves around a blue collar workforce and still be comfortable presenting to executive leadership. So I said, Zeb, what do you think about a police officer, right? He fills out reports, he does investigations, and even a police chief? Well, that guy does presentations to the media, to, to public officials. And he says, absolutely, I would hire that. You're a genius, I, Jeremy. How I, did you come up with I, that? I don't know. It was just the guy called me that morning. Yeah, he, you're a genius. You're right. That's what he said. Yeah. So anyways, I told him, I said, hey, my buddy, I think is a good fit. And, you know, it's funny because he interviewed four people for the role. And, and my buddy ended up getting the job. So it wasn't like I was force feeding him one candidate, right? But I just thought that that was such an amazing stars align moment where I could create meaningful change in somebody's life who thought that they were never going to be able to leave this niche industry. And here he is four or five years later, climbing the corporate ladder in this oil field service company. And he just started as a field HR manager, you know, and he moved his wife and four kids from Fort Worth all the way to Lubbock, right? He had to be pretty sure that that deal was going to stick for sure. Thanks for sharing that. That's awesome. I, um, I'd love to hear about ideal, who are ideal clients? Because you serve both. I mean, you probably have a lot of people contacting you like, I want to find an amazing job, but you have companies, you know, contacting you. Mm -hmm. um, and then who's an ideal client for you? And, I, and then we'll talk about maybe Honeywell for a second. Because you serve a lot of different fields. Because um, I know, Jeremy, you serve financial, energy, legal, engineering, manufacturing, industrial technology. Talk about ideal clients. Yeah. So if you asked myself or, or one of my two VPs, we would give a different answer, right? So I've got, a, I've got an executive VP that runs our wealth management group, right? So think about wealth advisors. I've got another VP. She runs our law firm recruiting practice. So any law firm that's growing. The group that I manage... And the group that I'm personally responsible for driving revenue for is our energy, industrial, and manufacturing group. And so that's going to be companies that are, you know, one of two things, right? <clears throat> Maybe they're a mid middle market or enterprise level company that, that makes something, right? Do they make plastics? Do they make um, consumer packaged goods, right? Food products, chemicals, somebody that makes something, an industrial manufacturer, and then uh, we also recruit for a lot of private equity funded energy, industrial and technology companies as well. Right. Because, you know, as I mentioned, when you're the best direct hire recruiting firm in Houston, probably the world. But, you know, I don't have those awards yet. Um, you know, we're, we're typically not going to be the cheapest option on the block. Right. There's people that work from home in their boxers with no overhead that can charge fees probably half as mine. Right. So when you're working with the top firm, much like companies work with EY, PwC, Deloitte, those companies are way more expensive than a solo you know, CPA working out of his house, right? But the point that I'm trying to make is we recruit for private equity funded companies and venture capital funded companies because it's about speed and accuracy to grow and increase the enterprise value of their business. And they don't have as much emotional tie to that recruiting fee because it's not coming out of the entrepreneur's pocket. Does that make sense? Completely. Yep. So it's middle market and enterprise level companies that have recruiting agency budgets of seven figures plus. And then, of course, it's private equity and venture capital, industrial energy, manufacturing and technology companies. And so if someone is a degreed engineer, right, it could be. The title engineer it could be supply chain, manufacturing, operations. 
It could be a technical salesperson that needs to be an engineer. We are the best resource in the entire injury or industry for those positions. And this kind of relates to Honeywell. What'd you do with them? Yeah. So uh, Honeywell uh, is, is my largest enterprise client. It's a seven figure account for us. And uh, you know, the way that we got in was I worked with an individual when I was 22, 23 years old, I was working at an HR consulting company and inside sales. She liked me. I liked her like professional, or, you know, like best friends. And she knew that I was the smart guy. She, but whenever I went and started my own firm, she kind of followed my trajectory on LinkedIn and, and was proud of me. And one day they were bitching on their HR call about they couldn't get this field cybersecurity engineer position filled in Northern California. They needed to have a CISSP certification. They needed to travel 90%. They needed to be able to lift 100 pounds over their head. There was all these variables that they needed. And, and, and all the recruiting agencies that they use could not close the deal. So you have this, you know, 28, 29-year-old HR generalist raise her hand on the on the call and say, a friend of mine owns an agency. I trust him. I think that he could close the deal. And they let this little tiny recruiting firm in the door at Honeywell International. Actually, it was Honeywell Process Solutions, a subsidiary of Honeywell Performance Materials, a subsidiary of Honeywell International on my recruiting agreement, my paper, right? After I closed the deal, I sent them an invoice. They said, what the hell is this? People at corporate are like, this isn't an approved vendor. And so then they had to get me in the vendor list after the fact. They hired my candidate, but we found someone. We found someone within two weeks. And it was because we don't post the job on ZipRecruiter or Monster or CareerBuilder or Indeed or LinkedIn and wait for applicants. <coughs> Our clients can post the jobs. You come to us when you want us to build a very definitive project of 20 to 50 people that are qualified in the whole in the whole United States. And we cold call, cold email, cold text message, cold Facebook message. We call their mom. We call their dad. We call their ex-wife. How much does it pay? Oh, it pays 140. Oh, yeah. Call him. He needs to increase his child support. <laughs> That's like what we do. We're headhunters. Yeah, private investigator of uh, finding. I love it. I love it. I love that we do this. I feel like we may be the only ones to do it this way. I don't even post the jobs. Other agencies want to talk about AI, right? Artificial intelligence and and lead scoring for resumes and and and, and drip marketing. We have AI. It's called actual intelligence. We don't need that. artificial intelligence. That's our competitive advantage. Jeremy, um, I want to be the first one to thank you. And um, before we end, I want to just point people to check out EncoreSearch.com to learn more and uh, check them out what they're doing. And Jeremy, thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. I had a lot of fun. What I got